please turn to the book of Acts chapter 20. Now, as you're looking for Acts 20, I want to kind of bring you up to date on what we've done here. We talked about, starting in Romans chapter 1, the fact that Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, said that he was separated unto the gospel of God. And we saw that the gospel of God is the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and God proved that by raising him from the dead. Paul needed to lay this as a foundation, particularly at the time when he was preaching to Jews. Because if he's not the Son of God, then there would be no point in preaching the next gospel that he preached, which is called the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the gospel of our salvation. It is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it's that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was crucified, uh, buried, and raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. If he's not the Son of God, then him dying on the cross meant nothing for you and me. Because if he wasn't the Son of God and raised from the dead, then he's just another man that was crucified. So Paul established a foundation with the gospel of God as he went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And as we've talked about many times, the Greek is a Gentile, a non-Jew. But a Greek is a Gentile in your Bible anyway, unless it's particularly pointing out somebody from Greece who might not believe in God, like the Athenians that Paul talks to in Acts chapter 17. But unless... Otherwise mentioned, a Greek is a Gentile that fears God. He, he is looking for um, a blessing through Israel. Now, I want to demonstrate a Greek to you tonight before we go on, or an example of one, so that you can see a distinction, because what I want to show you next, and what we're about to read, is when Paul preached the gospel, and he calls it the gospel of the grace of God. Now, there's always going to be those <coughs> excuse me, who say there's only one gospel. Well, that's just not true. Uh, God preached the gospel to Noah, and it had nothing to do with Christ dying for his sins. Uh, the, the gospel to Noah was, get in the ark and I'll save you, <laughs> so to speak. <clears throat> that was good news to everybody on the ark. It was bad news for the rest, you know. Well, today the gospel of Christ is he died for your sins and buried and raised again. That's good news to us that are saved. But if an individual today would reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and will not trust that he died for their sins and try to earn salvation through religious works, they might as well have been one that didn't get in the ark. <clears throat> they're going to be held accountable for rejecting the gospel of Christ. But the gospel of the grace of God is what I want to discuss tonight. And in order to do that, I need to deal with something concerning the Jew and the Greek. Now notice in Acts chapter 20, and we're going to begin in verse 17. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows that when he gets there, he's going to be arrested. He's been to Jerusalem several times in his ministry you know, five that are recorded in the book of Acts and who knows how many others in his ministry. <clears throat> but this time he knows he's in for trouble. And so he meets some elders from the church at Ephesus and has them come to meet him on the coast. And he's basically going to tell them, you're not going to see me anymore uh, because of the danger that I'm going to be in shortly here. But I want us to read part of what he says to them. In verse 17, <clears throat> And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. There it is. What did he testify? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before I go any further, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Jew, did he worship God? Yes, he did. He knew who God was. What about the Greek in this context? Yes, he did. Where did Paul find these Greeks when he found them? In the synagogue, which is where the Jews met to worship God. Well, what would a Greek be doing there? He's not a Jew. He's fearing the Lord. He's seeking the Lord, seeking wisdom of the Lord, and seeking a blessing from the Lord through Israel. <clears throat> so did they need to repent from their idols and their cigarette smoking and card playing? No, these were zealous individuals, the Jew and the Greek. They were doing what they knew to be the right thing to do as far as the law was concerned when Paul found them. So repentance toward God is not quit your sin and then you're dancing and you're chewing tobacco. You know, repentance toward God for them was to reconsider, and that's what the word means, repent, is the Greek metaneo, reconsider, change your mind towards God. <clears throat> well, what did they believe? They didn't believe against God, they believed in God. So what did they need to repent concerning God? Well, it had to do with who God is. The gospel of God declares Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, raised from the dead with power in Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> so, they didn't know that. As far as the Jews and the Greeks out there scattered amongst the nations at the time Paul reached them, as far as they were concerned, Jesus of Nazareth was a criminal that they crucified in Jerusalem. Because the Jews that may have been there at Pentecost when they said, crucify him, we'll have no king but Caesar, when they went back home to their countries, they would have said, you wouldn't believe some guy we just killed back there claiming to be the son of God, claiming he's equal with God. And so that might have been as much as they knew about Jesus Christ until Paul came and showed by the scriptures, no, he's the Christ. He's the king, the Messiah, the son of God, and God raised him from the dead. And so repent, change your attitude about who God is, and realize that he's Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. Then he says, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And that would be faith in what he did for them in dying for their sins, rather than believing you could be justified by working and keeping the law. So in a very real sense, not that it has to mean this, you understand, not that it's limited to this, but I see repentance toward God as in connection to the gospel of God, that he's the son of God, Jesus. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ in connection to the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins. You see that? See that? And so he's, that's what he's done up to this point. And the issue I want to make clear is that who he testified to is the Jew and the Greek. Hold on there to Acts chapter 20, and very quickly with me, turn to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 1, we've read this verse many, many times, and I'm sure almost everybody here could quote it by heart. But verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That is, that he died for your sins, was buried, and raised again. That's the gospel of Christ. He says, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. There's that Jew and Greek again. So the everyone that believeth in the context and at the time he wrote this, everyone was everyone that's either a Jew or a Greek. It's not true today because the God will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But that was a mystery that we're going to get to shortly. At this point so far, God's preaching this God, Paul rather, God is preaching through Paul, this gospel to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Individuals that fear God, worship God, and work righteousness in some cases. Now, it's to the Jew person, also to the Greek. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> if it was just an isolated incident, we could say, oh, well, you're just making that up. Well, there's several. <laughs> so look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and notice in... Verse 21. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, again Paul writing, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For uh, the Jews require a sign. 
and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. And that would be Jews and Greeks that don't believe. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Who are called in verse 24? Jews and Greeks. So, while the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, in the context and at the time, it's everyone that believes as long as they're a Jew or a Greek. Any other Gentile could be saved if he went through the Jew to get it. And let me give you an example of that. I want you to turn. Uh, we will come back to Acts 20 in just a moment now, so bear with me. But uh, if you've got enough fingers, get Matthew 15. You can let go of 1 Corinthians and Romans. If you want, hold on to Acts 20. Get Matthew 15 <coughs> and Mark chapter 7. Matthew 15 and Mark chapter 7. <coughs> we'll start in Matthew 15. And by the way, you don't have to read it right now, but in Matthew 10, when Jesus sent the twelve out to preach, he said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. And unto any city of the Samaritan enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel Jesus preached and the twelve preached was not the gospel of God, was it? It was the kingdom of heaven at hand. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. It can't be the gospel of God because the gospel of God is Jesus Christ is the Son of God and was proven to be so by the resurrection from the dead. Well, he hadn't died yet. He was the Son of God, and Peter declared it in Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and yet he hadn't died yet to prove that. And of course, the gospel of Christ is, He died for our sins, was buried and raised again. They couldn't have been preaching that gospel. He's alive. <clears throat> so their gospel is the gospel of the kingdom, and that's what they preach. Now here's Jesus with that gospel, and watch what happens. Verse 21. Matthew fifteen twenty one. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And by the way, that's outside of Israel. <clears throat> it's outside of, it's the northern tip of Israel going on into Syria. The area is really called Phoenicia. Okay. And verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. Now, at this point, I want you to turn to Mark 7. Hold on to Matthew 15 and turn to Mark 7. Mark 7 is another account of the same event. And the only reason I'm doing this is because I want to show you another description of this woman. Matthew just referred to her as a woman of Canaan. I want you to look in Mark 7. Notice in <clears throat> verse 24. And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Now, before I go further, I've got three descriptions of the woman. She's a woman of Canaan, she's a Syrophoenician by nation, and she's a Greek. Is there anybody that doubts she's not a Jew? <clears throat> Three strikes, you're out. She's a Syrophoenician by nation, which means she's not from Greece, but that means she can, but she can still be a Greek. Syrophoenician is her nationality. That's where she was born and raised. She's a woman of Canaan. Probably has something to do with her ethnicity. She's of the Canaanite seed, while a Jew would be a Semitic, Shemite. And then she's called a Greek, which ha probably has to do with either her language or her culture, or her understanding and heart toward the Lord. <clears throat> she fears God, seeks wisdom. But notice what happens. Now, holding on there to Mark 7, go back to Matthew 15, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. They're a lot of help, a lot of compassion. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Does that mean hearted? No. It's the truth. 
His gospel is the gospel of the kingdom, which was a kingdom promised to Israel. What does a Gentile have to do with that? Absolutely nothing, unless they've got the right attitude. Now watch. Verse 25, Then came she and worshipped and saying, Lord, help me. Do you realize she knows who he is? She calls him Lord. She worships him. She even knew he's the son of David. How in the world would somebody know Jesus is the son of David? They could only know by the scriptures. This woman is smart. She's been studying her Bible. Her Old Testament scriptures are read every Sabbath day in the synagogue. She knew that the Christ was of the seed of David. She knew he's the Lord and the Son of God. She's got her act together. She's no idol-worshiping Gentile. Verse 26. Even with all that, but he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. <clears throat> he called her a dog. Who are the children? Well, sheep of Israel. What's the bread? The word, the gospel he's preaching. In effect, he's saying it wouldn't be right for us to take the children's dinner and give it to you dogs. And she doesn't disagree. Verse 27, she said, truth, Lord. <laughs> Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And you know what he did? Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto, um, <clears throat> even, excuse me, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. There's only two times in the life of Jesus Christ recorded in your Bible that he commented on great faith. One of them is this woman here. The other one was a man who was a centurion with a sick servant and he said of him, I've not seen so great faith in Israel. He was a Gentile. The only two people Jesus Christ ever commented about great faith were Gentiles. You know why? Because the Jew requires what? A sign. A sign. They're not, they, hey, prove it to me. I need something to prove. The Jew had the Gentile, they had faith. Now, go to Mark 7 right quick and you can let go of Matthew 15. <clears throat> In the same dialogue, notice that he says, excuse me, um, I lost my place here. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> there we go. Verse 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it under the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Now, in Matthew, she said of the master's table. In effect, what is going on here? She knows that a Gentile that's going to get anything from God is going to get it from a Jew. And they're going to receive the scraps. Israel is their master. In what way? Spiritually. How come? Because they're the ones who are going to be a kingdom of priests and kings, a holy nation. When the Lord comes back, they could have received it if they would have received Jesus Christ, but they crucified him. And they said, well, I have no king but Caesar. So the king went away and the kingdom was taken into a period, I guess you could say, of abeyance. <clears throat> it's not here right now. But he'll come back and he'll restore the kingdom to Israel. Yet, the Gentile, as far as they knew, their only hope was to fear God and bless Israel. And they might get some crumbs that would fall from the table. Let me show you what I'm talking about now. You can let go of everything but Acts 20 and turn to the book of Isaiah. It is very possible that she knew something about the, the Syrophoenician woman there, knew something from the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 49, and notice in verse 3, and you'll see very, very easily a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ is being uh, talked about here. And in verse 3, and he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work with my God. 
And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, and they weren't when he came, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to whom man despiseth. I mean, you can't mistake that if you try. It's Jesus Christ, and Isaiah, the prophet, is declaring he's not just going to restore Israel, he's going to be a light of salvation to the Gentiles in all the earth. This woman knew that. But she also knew something else. Turn to Isaiah 60. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 60. And as I mentioned... Did Israel receive their king when he came? No, they did not. They crucified him, and yet God made some promises that he must fulfill, and he will, when the Lord comes back. And Isaiah chapter 60 is a picture of that. In fact, for the context, you can back up two verses from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, and notice 59, verse 20. And we'll read verse 20 first for the context. It says... And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words, and on and on. In other words, we're talking about the second coming, because they didn't turn. They didn't receive him at that time when he came. He was meek and lowly, riding on the colt, the foal of an ass. And while many believed on him, the nation rejected him. When he comes back, he's going to be riding on a white horse with a sword, and he's got an army behind him. They're going to have a little bit different attitude next time. That's the second coming. So that's the context of Isaiah chapter 60 as we read verse 1. It says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Who is the light? Israel. Well, Jesus Christ is the light, and he is their light. You're exactly right, Sandra. So thee, in the context, is Israel. The light of Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the light that lighteth all men. He came unto his own, his own received him not. John chapter 1. So when Jesus comes back, he's the light that will bring light back to Israel. Uh, we talked about gross darkness would cover the people back in Isaiah 49. They're in that darkness now. Israel, the people. You're in a time of spiritual night right now. When the Lord comes back, he's the day spring, the morning star. The day will dawn, the day of the Lord. He comes back, the night ends, and righteousness will be restored to Israel. But until that time, they're in darkness. So that's why he's the light when he comes. In fact, Malachi 4 refers to him as the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. That he's going to come return with healing in his wings. He's their light. So the context is second coming of Jesus Christ to Israel. And the particularly is Jerusalem reflecting all believing Israel. Now let's keep going. Verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Who is thee in the context? Israel. So the Gentiles are going to come to Israel's light, which is Christ. That's what he said in Isaiah 49, Thou shalt be for salvation of the ends of the earth, and on and on. Well, let's look at the context of all this now. <clears throat> when in the context of this, verse 4 says, Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee, thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. In other words, the regathering of Israel. Uh, verse 5, Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Look in verse um, 9. Surely the isles shall wait for me and, and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons, Israel's sons, from far, their silver and their gold with them, under the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers, who are strangers, Gentiles, yeah. shall build up thy walls, and their kings 
Gentile kings, shall minister unto thee. Is a minister the boss or the servant? He's the servant. These kings are servants. For in my wrath I smote thee. God smote Israel for rejecting his son. But in my favor have I had mercy on thee. He will restore the mercy according to Hosea chapter 1. Verse 11. Therefore thy gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day nor night. That men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles. And that their kings may be brought. You know what the forces of the Gentiles refers to? Their wealth. Their riches. Their money. Their tithes and offerings. Their food and everything. And watch verse 12. For the nation and kingdom, talking about in the time when the Lord comes back, the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee, Israel, shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Now you know why she said, even the dog eats of the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She knows her place, this Gentile woman in Acts, uh, excuse me, Matthew 15 and Mark 7. She knows that in order to be a Gentile in the kingdom, she's got to fear God and serve Israel. She's going to be a servant to them. Why? They're going to rebuild the walls. We just read that, I think, in verse 10. Verse 11. Thy gates shall... uh, um, Where is it? Verse 10, thank you. Sons shall build up thy walls. In that context, look in chapter 61. Still, Still saying basically the same thing concerning Israel in the time... Of restitution of all things. Israel at the time the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It's a future day. And it says in verse 4. And they shall build the old wastes. Who is they? Gentiles. They're, They're the wall builders. They're the bricklayers. They're the servants. They shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities. The desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Who is you? That's Israel. All Israel. And the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. And ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. These people today that say, oh, you've got to bless Israel, you've got to bless Israel. They know what they're talking about. They're going to end up having to be servants to Israel. <clears throat> they think the Israel here is all saved Christians, but that's not the context here. It's the house of Jacob, the house of Israel, at the second coming. Now my point is, when that Syrophoenician woman came up to Jesus Christ, she knew this. Obviously, she knew about service. In fact, the, the centurion that Jesus commented about the great faith, who was also a Gentile, He commented and said, Lord, don't even bother coming into my house. I know I'm not worthy because I too am a man uh, of authority. And I say to this one, go and he goes and come and come. He's almost in a sense saying, hey, I know about being a servant. I know about servants and I'm going to be your servant. So he knows something too. So Jews and Greeks. Now that was the gospel of the kingdom. The Greek wasn't going to get anything Until the kingdom. That's when Gentiles come to the light of his rising. But, bless God, Jesus Christ came unto his own, and his own received him not. The kingdom did not come when he was there. So what's a Gentile to do? What's a Gentile that fears God to do, that knows if he can be a servant of Israel, that he'll be in the kingdom? Well, he's got a problem. If God's going to stop dealing with Israel as a nation, which he did in 70 AD, he destroyed the the city and the walls, that's why they've got to rebuild them and repair the waste cities and on and on. So he stopped dealing with Israel nationally because he started a mystery with Paul that concerned Jesus Christ dying for your sins, never mind the covenant concerning the law and everything else. He said if you believe on Jesus Christ, you can be saved. It's the power of God and salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, God knows that a Jew doesn't have a chance if Israel's gone unless he provides another means for them, which will save both Jew and Greek. And it's the gospel of Christ. So Paul preaches the gospel of Christ to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's what he's saying, if you'll go back to Acts 20, that he has done up to this point. Here we are. He's on his way to Jerusalem, as we've just read, and he's getting ready for some trouble. So in a sense, he's sort of summarized what he's done so far. 
That's like the story so far. Verse 21 again. Testifying both to Jews and Greeks, and all, uh, uh, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God in the gospel of Christ, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, the gospel of God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ. That's what he's done so far, preaching to Jews and Greeks. And Greeks are Gentiles. But not all Gentiles are Greeks. Like I've said, all Texans are Americans, but bless God, not all Americans are Texans. Okay? And so you've got some Gentiles out there that didn't know what that Syrophoenician woman knew. In fact, they could care less about the Jew, don't know anything about their God, wouldn't give anything to a Jew, and they worship idols, and they do every unclean thing against the law, and they are called vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. According to Genesis chapter 12, if anybody blessed, any family blessed Abraham's seed, Israel, he'd get a blessing. But if he cursed Abraham's seed, he got a curse. And God would have been right to take all those cursed Gentiles and lump them all into the bottom of hell, and it would have been just and right, and nobody would have argued against it. Not the devil, not the angels, not Christ. But look what Paul says in verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, <clears throat> not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, what's waiting for me in Jerusalem is affliction, and I'm going to be chained, I'm going to be imprisoned. Verse 24, that none of these things move me, in other words, I'm not afraid. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. There it is. The gospel of the grace of God. In effect, he's saying, in order for me to finish my course and the ministry I received, I must testify the gospel of the grace of God. And it means bonds and afflictions for me, but I've got to do it. I am bound to do it. And he did it. And the reason I know that, you can let go of Acts 20 and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you'll notice 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he's at the end of his life, Paul is. He's, he's in prison for a second time uh, and that we believe. And he's about to be executed. And he says in verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. If Paul finished his course, bless God, he testified the gospel of the grace of God, didn't he? Because he said he had to do that to finish his course. Well, what in the world is the gospel of the grace of God? Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> And I tell you what, when you get Ephesians chapter 3, go ahead and turn to Acts 22 and let me share a little thing with you that will help make Ephesians 3 make sense. In Acts 22, Paul got to Jerusalem. And sure enough, they arrested him. <laughs> Just like the Holy Ghost said it would. He was seen in the temple, some Jews from Ephesus, oddly enough, <clears throat> saw him and said, that's the troublemaker. And they accused him of bringing a Greek into the temple, which, as you know, to a Jew would have been sacrilege, because Greeks are uncircumcised. They're Gentiles. Well, Paul didn't have a Greek in the temple, but they said that he did, and got all Jerusalem stirred up, and apparently it was a feast day, so there were many thousands of Jews in Jerusalem that believed even, and they were zealous of the law, and James warned Paul when he got there, he said, when they find out you're here, they want to get, they're going to ask some things about you. You know, they're hearing all these rumors. You better go do this thing. Purify yourselves in the temple with these men that we have there and show them that you walk uprightly according to the law. And Paul said, okay, I'll do that. Well, that's when they saw him and they thought, he's got a Greek in there. So they had a conniption fit. It's one thing to have a fit, but a conniption fit, that's something else. 
they dragged Paul into the street, out of that temple and began to beat him. And a Roman centurion thought he was some horrible, wicked criminal, an Egyptian that had committed insurrection and, co and caused the murder of hundreds of men. And he grabbed him and probably saved his life in doing it. But grabbed him away from that mob and began to carry him off thinking he's that Egyptian. And Paul says to him, may I speak to the people? And the Romans said, can you speak Greek? Aren't you that Egyptian? He says, no, I'm a Roman citizen and a, ci a, a citizen of no mean city. And the man said, have at it. So Paul began to speak to these Jews that were so mad they were beating him. And he speaks in Hebrew. And they quieted down. First he says, let me talk to you. And they quieted down. But when he heard that they spoke in the Hebrew tongue, they got even more quiet. And so he begins to share his past and how he got saved by meeting the Lord on the road to Damascus. And he's telling them all these things. And they're listening. So he preaches a thing. And I'm not going to read all of it, but just come down to verse 17. This is after he talks about his salvation account. Acts 22:17. Paul narrates, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, sometime after the Damascus incident, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him, and he's talking about Jesus, saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. In effect, Paul's kind of arguing with the Lord saying, oh, well, listen to me. They're going to know I was persecuting all these people. They'll see the change in me. And God said, no. He says, get out, Paul. Verse 21. And he said unto me, depart. For I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Not Greeks, not near, but Gentiles that are far, far away. Verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air and on and on, what happens is the chief captain had to grab him and get him out of there. I mean, they carried him over their shoulders to keep them from tearing him into pieces. What's the word that he said that got him so mad? Gentiles. In the Hebrew tongue, that's the word goyim. Dogs. You know, it's like, <clears throat> this is how a Jew would have felt about that. Imagine an operating room sterilized for heart surgery. I mean, there's not a microbe of any kind of bacteria in it. It can't be. Scrubbed and cleansed and sanitized and everything else. And then some old wet, muddy dog busts through the door and shakes mud all over the place. That's what a Jew would have thought of a Gentile like this. The, 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 the revulse, why, we, got, we can't do the surgery here. This is unclean. We've got to move to another place. This place has to be sterilized and disinfected. A Gentile's in and here. And Paul's saying, Christ the Lord is telling me to go to them? He's talking about the cursed Gentiles. And they said, oh, that's it, we got him, he needs to die. There's, no, there's not one shred of scripture that says God would ever accept those Gentiles. We know that the Gentiles that he's going to save are going to be our servants. They'll fear God. They will submit themselves to us. He's talking about Gentiles that worship idols and eat pork. And so they wanted him dead. They go back to Ephesians 3 and bless God. He's writing to that kind of Gentile. This time he's writing to Ephesians that he doesn't know. Not the elders of the church that were Jews and Greeks. This time he's writing to some Gentiles. And look who they are. Verse 1. Ephesians 3 verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. He's not saying prisoner like I'm a prisoner of love. He's literally in prison. He got arrested that day, otherwise they were going to kill him. He's literally in prison for these Gentiles. Now, as much as I'd like to believe when Paul says, you Gentiles, it's because he's from the south. Back up to chapter 2 and notice verse 11. <clears throat> verse 11 says, Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, 
just to show you who he's writing to, now look in verse 12, that at that time, whenever the time passed was, in verse 11, at that time, ye were without Christ, Ephesians 2.12, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Could you have said that about the Syrophoenician woman of Canaan? Why, she had a hope. The Lord even healed her daughter. Could you say that about the Gentiles in Isaiah 49 and 60? Why, they're not without God. They, they're going to come to the light of Israel. They fear God. As a matter of fact, do you know who those Gentile nations are in Isaiah 60? They're the ones on the right hand in Matthew 25. Remember Matthew 25 when the king comes back and divides the nations as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats? And he puts the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. He's dividing nations, not livestock. They're nations. They're Gentile nations. You know who they are? They're the people that have gone through tribulation that weren't killed because they took the mark of the beast. But he didn't over yet, see. Because the one on the right hand... He says, come into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why, those Gentiles, what did they do? They says, why? What did we do? He says, I was hungry, you gave me meat. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Sick, and you visited me. They asked, when did we do this? And as much as you've done it on the one of the least of these, my brethren. Who are the brethren of the Lord? Israel. As much as you've done it on the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And they go into the kingdom. He calls them righteous. Then he says to the ones on the left hand, depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And they're like, well, what do we do? And remember, they didn't take the mark. If they had, they wouldn't be standing there. They did not take the mark. And what did they do wrong? He says, I was hungry, you gave me no meat. Thirsty, you gave me no drink. And they say, when did they not do this? If you didn't do it unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. You know what they didn't do? They didn't bless the Jews. They didn't submit themselves to the Jew, and they get thrown in the fire. The ones on the right hand go into the kingdom. They're the nations that they're going to go ye therefore and teach in Matthew 28. They're the nations that are going to bring their sons and daughters from afar, and the gold and the silver, and rebuild the waste cities and all of that. They're going to come to the light of Israel's rising, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You couldn't confuse those Gentiles with these Ephesians if you tried. Without God, without hope, without Christ, in verse 12, why did they have no hope? Because they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Had no part in Israel's inheritance. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Had no claim on the blessings of the promise because they didn't know God. They weren't the Gentiles of Isaiah 49. They're the Gentiles that deserve to be destroyed. And in verse <clears throat> um, 3, he calls them... By nature, the children of wrath. Right there at the very end. Then in verse 13, he says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Well, why now do they have this access to God? Go back to chapter 3 and let's put it all together. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... You dirty double dog Gentiles that had no hope in time past. You Gentiles that were fit to be destroyed and had no claim on the covenants of promise and no participation in the commonwealth of Israel. You Gentiles. Verse 2. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the prophecies? No. The mystery. This one isn't in the Scriptures. As I wrote before, a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Scriptures? No, by the Spirit. This is a mystery that God revealed to Paul that you can't find in Isaiah. You can't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These Gentiles, why, it says in other ages was not made known. They've known in the other ages about the Gentiles that would come to his light in the second coming. That's what the Syrophoenician woman knew. That's what she came up to Jesus and called him Lord. 
but not these Gentiles. He says this was a mystery which in other ages was not made known. What is the mystery? Verse 6. That the Gentiles, like these here, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Fellow heirs. If I told you that Bill Gates was my daddy and we're all going to be fellow heirs, would you be glad about that? <laughs> well, he's not. I'm sorry to let you down. <clears throat> but if we were fellow heirs, wouldn't we all have an equal share in that inheritance? There wouldn't be any servants, would there? Fellow heirs are on the same plane. But in the kingdom of heaven, the servants are Gentiles that fear God, and the priests and kings are the Jews. They're not fellow heirs. They're below them. God told them in that kingdom they would be above all people, for all the earth is mine. These right here are fellow heirs. Jew, Greek, Gentile, no difference. Same level, and of partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Do you realize that the Jew and the Greek, because they were in the promises, they got to hear the gospel of Christ? Do you realize that these Gentiles, because they heard the gospel of Christ, they got to be in the promises? They're the opposite. You couldn't miss that if you tried. These are Gentiles that are made partakers of his promises in Christ by the gospel. What gospel? Well, it's the gospel of the grace of God, which is the gospel of Christ to all men. <clears throat> this time it's not another gospel. I mean, none of it is another gospel. This is the foundation. This is the salvation. And this is the extenuation of the gospel of Christ. Meaning, not limited to Jews and Greeks, but open to all this time. All men, without distinction. In fact, he says that. Verse 7. <clears throat> He says, Well, I was made a minister concerning this gospel, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, Paul, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know why they're unsearchable? That's why, right, Debbie, you can't find them in the Scriptures, because they're not there. These Gentiles are in the covenants of promise. They're not the Gentiles in Isaiah 60 and 61. They're the Gentiles that deserve to be destroyed. And God's extended grace to them. I mean, if you get to thinking about this, you, it's no wonder John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. He was a vile slave trader responsible for the deaths of probably hundreds of men. And he got saved. And he said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We're the wretches, folks, that got this grace. We weren't doing anything to gain God's favor. We simply were saved by his mercy. Verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men, not the Jew and the Greek, all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. It wasn't hidden in the Scriptures. There were mysteries in the Scriptures. This one was hidden in God. And I'll tell you how well it was hidden. Verse 10. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, that's us, the manifold wisdom of God. God hid this mystery so well that even his angels didn't know about it. And they're learning it now. Now, by the church, the body of Christ, the principalities and powers in heavenly places are learning about God's amazing grace and his manifold wisdom. And why in the world would he do this? Why doesn't he destroy all those Gentiles all these years? Why has he put up with them? Why has he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath? Now you know why. Because he knew that there would be some cursed Gentiles that if they heard the gospel of God's grace would receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And he couldn't destroy them until then. He waited until that could be declared. And it couldn't be declared until Jesus Christ offered himself up at Calvary. And that was a mystery too. But this mystery was hid in God why he would even extend it to the likes of us. 
after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the angels must have been thinking, why don't you now restore the kingdom to Israel? That's what the twelve asked him in Acts chapter 1. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons. Why? Because God had a mystery hidden in him concerning a time. And the last thing I want you to see is 1 Timothy chapter 2 concerning the gospel of the grace of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul mentions prayers being made for kings and men that are in authority. And in verse 3 he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. That's not God's going to save all men. It's God will have all men to be saved. His desire is that all men be saved. But he's powerless to do a thing to save them outside of what he's already done in offering up his son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. The power of God unto salvation is to them that believe. If men won't believe, they cannot be saved. So he says it's his will that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. God wants men saved and wants them to know something. He wants them to know the truth when they're saved. Verse 5. But there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Well, how come it was only to the Jew first and also to the Greek when Paul started his ministry? It wasn't due time. And what we covered in the last lesson was because there were some Jews that Paul had to reach called the remnant, according to an election of grace in Romans 11. And if he had already started going to these dog Gentiles, those Jews would have never listened to him. They'd have said, Paul, you're just as... They wanted to kill him too. He had to get them first. A remnant that had not yet bowed the knee to the image of Baal, spiritually speaking. And once he reached them... The book of Acts ended. Once he went to Rome and testified that truth to them, he said, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. In fact, he says, the gospel of salvation is sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. And the the book closed, and Paul remained in prison and wrote seven epistles from prison. Seven, the number of completion. Right? He wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. And in those seven letters, he testified the gospel of the grace of God, the mystery of the dispensation of grace to all men. And you won't even find it in his first letters. Romans, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. You won't find it to all men. You find it to Jews and Greeks. It's the same truth extended by a mystery that God kept hidden in himself. When people finally get a hold of that and see, then they realize that God is not judging man for sin today. He can't. How can you extend grace and mercy and at the same time pour out wrath? 2 Corinthians 5 says God is not imputing trespasses unto the world. He's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Why are we still here? Our job is to tell all men and show all men the fellowship of the mystery. Let them know that they can be saved. Fellows in a ship. Fellowship. All together. Jew, Greek, Gentile, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian. Everybody together. If they will trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Believing that what he did at Calvary was sufficient to pay their sin debt. Not by 